my name is Roman Yavich. My company is called Learn From Travel. I'm, I'm very excited to be joined today by just, Justin Gomez. And this is part of our International Conversations webinar series. Although I don't, you know, I don't like to use the word webinar because it implies just listening. I really want um, active participation to happen from everybody on the call. So please feel free to interrupt us uh, or maybe raise your hand, raise your digital hand or raise your actual hand. Um, and we can, um, we can, I'd love for, for people to ask questions of Justin um, or of myself and uh, really create some dialogue. As I mentioned, this is part of our international conversation series. A lot of these conversations are with folks that we work with in different countries. Um, in Justin's case, Justin and I met on a faculty-led program that he co-led uh, to Colombia that was about the business of the cut flower industry. Um, about 80% of all flowers that you see sold in the States are actually from Colombia. And uh, Justin and uh, another faculty uh, traveled uh, from Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo traveled to Colombia to meet with farmers and exporters and learn all about the supply chain and the various entrepreneurship dynamics that exist in that industry. We have one more person joining us. Give me just a sec. I'm going to turn off the waiting room so that it's a little bit easier. Um, so learn from travel is a provider of faculty-led study abroad programs. We also do virtual international education. And what we really pride ourselves on is community-based programming. So that means a lot of times we're taking students to rural areas. We're working with local nonprofits community leaders, and otherwise um, engaging students in pretty much off the beaten path activities, ones that give them cultural immersion opportunities and a really authentic view of the destinations where we organize the programs. All the programs are custom. And um, if any of you have interest in, in traveling with us or organizing a virtual program, uh, please reach out. So, uh, Justin, I, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, you know, I, as I mentioned, you know, we, we met on one of the programs, but I know you have a you know, rich background. Um, so I, I, I'd rather you introduce yourself than, than uh, me try to summarize it. Awesome. Thank you, Roman, uh, for having me here today. And uh, hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Justin Gomez, and I am a CQ certified facilitator, and CQ stands for Cultural Intelligence. Um, I am based in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, but um, I also uh, consider Belize home. I spent uh, almost half of my life there uh, from the time I was born until um, I left to come to the U.S. to go to college. Um, I've worked in higher education, but more recently, um, I've taken an exit, um, like many folks, and um, I'm now working in the DEI consulting space. I work at a uh, Portland-based startup called Diversity Science, um, and just before that, I was uh, doing my own work through uh, Cultural Collaborative, which was a consultancy focus on helping people to um, enhance their cultural intelligence. So uh, that has been sort of the basis of my work. Um, I consider myself a Renaissance business person because I also do um, career counseling um, and consulting as well. And so um, give, being an entrepreneur really um, is what I'm doing now um, in addition to uh, my professional work. And so um, I was really excited to come in today um, you know, and share what I know um, and my experiences uh, in cultural intelligence work um, and how international experiences um, are very valuable and powerful um, in helping people to um, enhance those skills. So uh, that's a little bit about me and my uh, professional background. Um, and as we talk today um, and we converse today, we'll probably learn more about uh, me uh, as well. Okay, awesome, Justin. Thank you again for being here. Um, so, so what I want to do today is talk a little bit about cultural intelligence. Um, I want to then also talk a little bit about your experience with faculty-led study abroad for anybody that's considering that. Um, mm -hmm. 
and as also talk specifically about Belize. Um, Belize is one of my favorite countries of all the countries that I've traveled to. Um, it's one of the most multicultural countries that I've experienced and uh, just a fascinating place to, to travel to and especially to learn from if, if uh, you know, on a, on a faculty led program. So I'm excited to get your insight into one of my favorite countries. If for those of you that can make it all the way to the end of this conversation, we have a little slideshow that will show along with our conversation about Belize. So uh, let's dive into it. Um, Justin, can you talk a little bit about what cultural intelligence is? I have to be honest, I, I never even heard about this term before I met you. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, it, it, it's been really cool to, to learn more about it. And, and mm -hmm. um, so can you give us a kind of a quick definition for anyone who might not be familiar with what cultural intelligence is? Sure. So cultural intelligence is uh, similar to other intelligences that, you know, uh, researchers have looked at IQ, people are familiar with EQ. And so I tend to think that CQ or cultural intelligence picks up where EQ leaves off. And so um, it's really competency focus. Um, so it's something we all have, um, something that we can measure and something that can be improved. And I think that that's the most important piece about CQ is that it isn't something that's fixed. Um, when we really think about cultural intelligence, we're really looking at four primary competencies. The first one being your drive. That's just how motivated, how excited you get about learning about other people and about other cultures. Um, then there's CQ knowledge, which is um, how much you know about how cultures are similar and different. I tend to tell people it's how much you know about your own culture and how um, it, relates to how you relate to other cultures. Then there's CQ strategy, which is our ability to, um, I guess, overcome or mitigate our implicit biases and be able to adjust our mental maps so that we can learn how to successfully lead and work across cultures. And then lastly, um, there's CQ action, which is really about behavioral CQ. It's really about how we navigate not only our world, but how we na navigate the other cultural worlds um, that people live in. So it's really about the how we say it, what we say, how we do it, when we do it, why we do it, anything that has to do uh, with behavior. And so there's other sub dimensions. I'm not going to give you a whole lecture today about it, but essentially, um, the long and short of CQ is that it is something that's competency based and it is something that can be measured and something that can be improved. Right. So, so I think that the measuring part of it, the quantification part of it is what makes it um, so valuable, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, this is something that, um, you know, people are more or less aware of anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but just being but being able to measure it um, seems like a really valuable um, you know, resource or tool, um, especially if we think about it in an international education concept. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how CQ is measured? Um, so, you know, we, most people are probably familiar with IQ and, and the, the different tests that can be taken. How, how is CQ measured? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very similar to um, other types of maybe um, psychological assessments, you know, um, that people might take. I would say that this one is more um, what they refer to as an EMA. I think that stands for like an ecological measurement assessment, something like that. I can't remember <laughs> what it stands for, but EMA, you can look it up. Um, but really it's giving folks a uh, sort of a snapshot in time of where your um, drive, knowledge, and strategy and your behavioral in terms of how you understand it in relation to other people. So when we're measuring CQ, it's a little bit different than when we're doing a personality assessment because there is no such thing as a culture of one. And if there was, it would be called personality, which we're aware of. So culture is about what is shared and it's um, asking you about how you perform, how you think, how you feel in relation to other people. So it might be people who you work with. It might be for students, people that you're learning, studying with um, within your social groups. Um, and how you would do something as opposed to how someone else might do it. So that's kind of how we look at it. And uh, it's not necessarily about a score of like a numerical score, like IQ, where it's like, oh, I have an IQ of 100 and some, I don't know what my IQ is, but you know, they, there's a score associated with it. CQ isn't um, 
about the numerical score. It's really about looking at whether you have low, moderate, or high CQ. And so there isn't a correlation between being from a particular culture or region or location or city um, or generational group or any of those that um, lends to someone having higher or lower CQ. Um, but there are experiences that can contribute to whether or not someone is able to have higher CQ in another area. And we use that to learn how we can help others to be able to develop their cultural intelligence. Okay, yeah, very cool. You know, I, I'm very numbers oriented. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's probably why I like it. Um, so, we, you know, we, we've discussed cultural intelligence in the context of international education that I've, I've always wanted to develop kind of um, an assessment almost of the impact that uh, a study abroad program could have on students in terms of cultural intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we haven't done this yet, uh, but, I, but I do hope that we get to do it at some point. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and what kind of impact you would expect um, traveling abroad, uh, especially in kind of in an organized uh, faculty-led type of a program what kind of an impact that could have on students in terms of their cultural intelligence and how you could go about measuring that? Mm -hmm. So I think that those international trips probably help students um, increase their CQ across all those four dimensions that I mentioned. Um, I think people who are interested and excited about participating in an international experience probably already have maybe moderate, even high CQ um, already, because if your CQ is low, an international experience probably doesn't sound like the like something very exciting that you might want to engage in. Um, so in that realm, um, I think, you know, if someone's at a moderate CQ and this might be their first experience, going into that might really help them to um, increase that CQ drive. But I think the two areas that it has the most impact on are probably their CQ knowledge, so their ability to learn and discern um, cultural similarities and difference, um, and then probably with the CQ strategy. Um, if anybody else here has been on an international trip, you know how tiring it can feel mentally and physically when you're exposed to a different um, culture, maybe if you're in a country where they speak a different language. Um, just based on how we're wired, right? Um, we're just processing all this information um, implicitly, explicitly, um, and it's a lot to take in. So um, it really helps us to build our capacity to be able to be exposed to um, new cultures, to new experiences. Um, and then lastly, it can really help with the behavioral piece. We begin to see how, um, you know, in, in different countries, different cultures, how people interact. Um, and so uh, I would say the across all these measures and international experience can help students begin to kind of move those numbers towards having higher um, CQ. Okay. Do you think that, so for me, one of the things that I remember about culture and international, you know, from, from a personal perspective, is when I traveled to Chile, I was there on a study abroad program. Um, I remember going through very kind of strong culture shock, right? And so that's a lot of times people, people, um, go through that when, when they're traveling internationally, especially living internationally. Um, is, is culture shock related? Is it part of that growth process in terms of cultural intelligence? Yes. And so that's where our CQ drive really kicks in. What we know is that sometimes going abroad isn't necessarily, uh, you know, some, some folks, right, might, uh, might use that as an opportunity to be like, whoa, I don't think I could do this. <laughs> this is exactly why we have these sort of sophisticated stereotypes maybe about this particular country or the, this particular group. Um, and this is why we want to teach students about cultural intelligence so what, that when they're experiencing culture shock, they begin to understand that it's not necessarily um, a time for you to lean into those stereotypes that we have because we all have them, but maybe it's more of an opportunity for you to learn about why you're experiencing culture shock. Why is it that things surprise you, right? Why is it that things shock you really? And it might be, um, so I guess part of what I didn't talk about too was in the CQ knowledge piece is really helping um, students to understand uh, cultural values. Um, and that's also another piece that's measurable in terms of understanding what your cultural values are. We all have them. And then that gives you an understanding of why 
there are certain things that surprise you, certain things that lead to culture shock, sometimes things that um, lead to conflict might be a difference in cultural values. Um, so th that's another important piece where I think um, teaching students about CQ, having them measure it and understand it before they go on an international experience can actually help them to enjoy that experience way more and learn way more. And so rather than approaching it with frustration, they really approach it with a growth and learning mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that it, it would be great to see more of a formal structure or more effort devoted to culture um, mm -hmm cultural intelligence and kind of creating the framework for students uh, around that in addition to the academic content of mm. study abroad programs. And so I think that that's something that uh, we're, we're looking forward to integrating more into our uh, programs. Mm -hmm. um, any questions so far from, from anyone? Any, any comments? Um, everybody good? I, I found it fascinating that when I, I I travel abroad, it, I actually probably learn more, at least the same amount, but probably more about my own culture than I do about the culture of the place that I'm visiting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of that is, is related to the concepts that you're talking about, right? It's not just understanding other people, it's really understanding yourself, mm -hmm. um, oftentimes understanding your biases. You know, a lot of times you, you go someplace and, um, and and you think, oh, well, these these people do do this in a in a way that's um, you know different. But a lot of times you think this this way is, is bad or this way is wrong because I you know I'm used to doing it this other way. Mm -hmm. And then you start thinking about it a little bit longer, and, and you realize that wait a minute, maybe my way isn't isn't the best, or maybe these are are you know equally fine ways of doing things. So um, that's actually one of my favorite things about travel is, is mm -hmm. kind of understanding limitations of my own kind of, um, mm -hmm. you know, my own biases or my own, um, you know, limited viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, it, and I think that's a really good point. It's that it goes beyond just this sort of understanding of culture. I, I think it, you know, it helps students to be able to better perform even when they enter the workforce now because they're entering into um, organizations that have culture. And so they begin to understand and um, they can be, what's the word? They, they have better self-efficacy or they have better efficacy when they enter um, those spaces, even in the classroom. Um, you know, I, I, there's so many benefits to derive um, from CQ. And um, yeah, I think that's also one of them is that it isn't just something that they'll have for this international experience, um, but it'll be something I think that will help them for the rest of their life. Okay, yeah, absolutely, I agree. So uh, before we move on to talking about the program in Colombia that we both participated in, um, I just wanna make sure there aren't any more questions about cultural intelligence in general from anybody on the call. And I can see the chat, so feel free to, you know. Yeah, type feel free to chat if you, if you feel, if you prefer that to raising your hand and speaking. Um, seeing none, <laughs> we'll move on. Um, so Justin, as I mentioned, we, we, we met on a program, on a faculty lab program that I guided in Colombia. And um, could you talk a little bit about um, that program and, and kind of your experience, especially preparing for it, or at least at first preparing for it. I know that the students came from, um, was it, is it a club or is it a program at Cal Poly that it focuses on kind of uh, diversity or can you talk a little bit about kind of the background of the students and how um, you know, that program came to be? Sure, so uh, yes, when I was working at uh, Cal Poly, my uh, a lot of my work had to do with uh, retention of first generation, limited income, um, and other margin students with marginalized identities. And so I was really excited about this Columbia trip because it was the first time we were taking a trip that was, um, I think 90% of the students were all first generation. Uh, I think 90% of them had never been abroad before. Um, and it, so it was really exciting and we were going to be learning um, about a topic I think that many people hadn't explored yet and it really wasn't my idea it was my colleague who um, was really fascinated and interested about this kind of supply chain 
um, that had to do with getting flowers from Colombia to other parts of the world, including the United States, and how um, it might be interesting to have students learn about that. Um, I think another piece of it that we were really interested in learning about was uh, exploring whether or not there was a connection between the cut flower industry and Colombia's transformation out of, um, you know, some historical things around the um, drug trade and all of that. So there were other like so, sort of social economic things that we were interested in exploring um, as well, I think. Uh, there was a lot of resistance internally from the university and maybe even from parents when they heard we were taking a trip to um, Colombia. And it was really an opportunity um, for us to sort of leverage some cultural intelligence, really teaching um, the institution and teaching um, parents, students um, about how Colombia had changed over the past few decades um, and that it was actually a relatively safe um, place to visit. Um, and being able to provide those types of reassurances. So I was thinking in terms of preparation, those were some of the concerns um, that came up in terms of like risk assessment, et cetera, with going to a country um, or, or going to Colombia. But those were things that we were able to um, sort of substantiate and were able to get through relatively easy. Um, we actually had a, an alum of the university actually sponsor um, a significant portion of the costs for students to participate on this trip. They were also a first generation student who had never um, been on an international experience and wanted to be able to give back and sort of pay it forward for those students. Um, and so that was also um, a really powerful part of that um, experience. Uh, we, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but before sure. we get to those, um, I just want to ask, I know you were just starting at that point in your kind of in your cultural intelligence career, if I'm not mistaken. Um, were you able to, were you, did you do any kind of prep work with the students specifically in that regard in, in terms of preparing them either for culture shock or otherwise kind of providing them this framework um, for understanding uh, culture and, and, you know, understanding bias and, and these kinds of things? Yes, we did. So, uh, well, one, um, there is a sort of, um, you know, required workshop from like the International Center on campus about preparing students. And so it was a part of that. We didn't do a formal assessment measure um, at that time, um, but we did have conversations with the students after we came back about what they learned about that experience and um, just creating that space for them to be able to reflect on what their expectations were going into it um, and how those align with, you know, their experience of going there and then coming back to the U.S. Um, something that I uh, really want to integrate is some sort of like a pre and post test into mm -hmm. our programs where um, we can see, um, you know, what is the, is the impact on students in, in, qualitative, in quantitative terms. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, you know, cultural intelligence. Um, so th there's a question uh, from Melissa. Um, I don't know if everybody can see the chat. I'll just read it really quickly. So the idea of utilizing CQ is making students aware of it prior to departure so that they can have a more enjoyable experience or learn to understand their own bias or to measure their growth. Um, Justin, what do you think? It's for all three of those things. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was thinking the same thing, yeah. Yes, it, it helps all around. Um, and I think it also too, you know, it helps, you know, people who are organizing these trips to be able to have an additional way to demonstrate the impact of learning, um, you know, that these experiences um, can have for students. Yeah, yeah. I, I think and those things are equally important too. I think that giving students any kind of opportunity to have an easier experience or, or a deeper kind of more profound experience um, is, is super important, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I think understanding your own bias is maybe one of the most important aspects of traveling abroad um, because it's, it's an easy way to encounter bias that we oftentimes are oblivious to. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, measuring growth, you know, I think that there's a lot of work, you know, academic work that's been done on impact on students, uh, but not much of it is in terms of, of cultural intelligence. So I think this is just another dimension by which we can evaluate the, the success of a study abroad program. Um, and Eileen was asking uh, specifically about that Columbia program, what year was it and which cities? If I'm not mistaken, it was at the, uh, in December of 2018. 
um, and we traveled to Bogota and Medellin, or Medellin, as the as the people from Medellin call it, and uh, a few of the little towns around uh, those areas. So that program included visits to uh, Chrys Chrysanthemum Farm, a very small producer, you know, farmer, uh, a, a medium-sized exporter. Um, and what was really cool, we also got to visit the embassy, the U.S. embassy in, in Bogota and, and speak with the, U, U, uh, the U.S. agricultural attache, the person that's basically dealing with the policy of, of you know, trade policy between the U.S. and Colombia. And flowers are, are a very you know, important um, industry for that person. So it was, it was a way for us to really learn about all the different facets and different parts of the supply chain. Of the, the flower yeah, and, it, and it was interesting. I, I learned something fascinating when we visited the U.S. Embassy about flowers and culture around the world that the U.S. we tend to have uptakes in, in flowers during Mother's Day, Valentine's Day, and it kind of dies down throughout the rest of the year. Whereas like in the Netherlands, for example, they have a consistent demand for flowers because people buy them weekly and keep them um, on the table. So that was really interesting. Um, I learned about the connection between culture and flowers too. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I, I never thought about the flower industry before that trip. And yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very uh, ubiquitous industry. You know, I think that, you know, people all over the world kind of, um, you know, buy each other flowers to, you know, convey their emotions. And it's something that I think is uh, universal, you know, and that's something about, you know, at the, at the U.S. Embassy, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's an interesting way for, for people from different cultures to actually, you know, this is a, a similarity that, that can, you know, bring people together. Um, you, you mentioned that the students after coming back were um, you, you had kind of conversations or other, you know, some other way of getting their feedback. Um, what did you yourself notice some changes in the students following this trip, obviously, especially I imagine for students that, that hadn't traveled abroad before, it must have been a very impactful, you know, experience. Could, could you talk a little bit about the changes that you saw or noticed? Sure. Um, well, I definitely saw it as an opportunity for students to be able to answer, you know, like interview questions when they were asking them about your experiences learning and working. Um, in an environment where you were familiar, students were able to sort of draw on those experiences. Um, I think they also really kind of help their peers, I think, in terms of like, you know, that peer education and peer development. A lot of them came back and really served as mentors, um, encouraging other students to, um, you know, engage in an international experience if that was something that was possible for them, sort of really becoming ambassadors for that. I think in addition, some of the changes were, I think people becoming a lot more open and understanding to engaging in opportunities maybe that they wouldn't have participated in before. Um, so like I said, I think helping them to, I, I think it even opened up people's um, sort of expanded their thinking to wanting to work for companies that had more of a global impact or that where they could um, have the opportunity to maybe even work um, internationally. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned um, career. I think that studying abroad is such a confidence builder, you know, because it, you, you travel somewhere unfamiliar and if, you know, you succeed at that experience, you know, you come back, hopefully you're, you're well and safe. Um, and I think that it, it's such a different experience and, and something that's challenging. And then you overcome that challenge. I think for a lot of students, it's, um, you know, it, it really builds their confidence. And, and aside from the knowledge that they get, aside from these kind of cultural awareness benefits, um, you know, I, I found that a lot of students, and myself included, when I, when I studied abroad, it, it just gave me a lot of confidence in terms of my career. Yeah. And, and I, curiosity, you know, I, I ended up working internationally, obviously. Yeah, no, and I, and I think another piece of it too, Roman, was um, I think helping students to become more sort of global, what do they say, develop a global mindset or being thinking of themselves more as global citizens. I think some of the students who went on this particular trip had never left California before to, you know, to even give you an idea. And so um, leaving California and then to be going into to another country, I think really helped them to kind of understand 
uh, one, how big the world is, but also how small it is at the same time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, w w what impact did that program have on you, Justin? I mean, um, you know, you obviously you're already, you know, in your career. Um, did you, w was that your first um, leadership experience on a study abroad program? Uh, that was actually my second one, um, okay. South America. I had previously went on another one, um, very similar where we visited Brazil. Um, but I think for me, it kind of reinvigorated my sense of like wanting to work in a space where I'm helping people. You know, I, I, already, I already had an interest in um, sort of DEI work and bias mitigation. But um, I think going on that experience, you know, it kind of helped to reinforce, um, you know, what some of the things I was already interested in. But, uh, interested in but also kind of gave me an opportunity to think about some you know ways that I could be more I guess creative in my career and yeah so for me it was also impactful I learned a lot um, and I think for me the most rewarding piece was being able to have that experience with the students and being able to see how much it helped them to um, to learn and to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah you know a lot of times we, we work with faculty who haven't led programs before um, and it, it's it's helpful to to hear your your feedback because you know a lot of times faculty don't really know what to expect um, a lot of times you know it involves extra work there's preparation and it's just it's it's probably more work than than the comp than the additional compensation you know so um, yeah I, I, it's I, I think I imagine that it's a rewarding experience for faculty and, and um, it's it's great to hear that you know, you had that kind of, uh, uh, that, that kind of experience. And I would say, I think what made this experience working with Learn From Travel different than maybe another, the other company that we had worked with, I think, like you mentioned, was the experience of doing more community-based experiences. So it didn't feel like we were just on another international excursion. It felt very personal, you know, having, um, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to mention this, but, you know, a couple of the experiences we had, we had meals in homes with some of the folks um, on the farms that we visited. And I think like those types of experiences, I don't know if other companies offer that, but I think those were really pivotal because they got to hear from, you know, I, I, I guess anybody who works at a hotel <laughs> is a Colombian too, but, you know, like they got to, I, I guess, see how, um, you know, people live and, and, and eat and, um, I think like, I think those were the most impactful experiences where they could have real conversations with people about politics, the economy, um, understand how um, people in other countries view and understand the United States. Um, so I think, yeah, that, that's where I saw the magic really happen. Yeah, definitely. And that's why we, that's why we take students to those kinds of places and have and facilitate those kinds of experiences, because a lot of times they are more authentic and, and, um, more impactful. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Eileen. How do we increase the CI or CQ of those who have no interest in improving it? So I think that the interest in improving it is just one of those four dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. That's the drive. So maybe you can comment about that, but I imagine that some of the other dimensions kind of increase inadvertently, right? Mm -hmm. If you can put students in those situations, um, the, the growth in terms of CQ probably happens organically. Yeah. So um, I think to answer your question, Eileen, it's uh, um, I'm going to go with a political answer here, which is it depends. <laughs> uh, what I have found is that um, people who are interested uh, or not interested in improving their CQ. I, I, here's what I'll say. I think the best way to get people to understand it and want to improve it is to be able to link it to something that they were already excited and passionate about. Um, and you can really find that maybe in any area of students' interest. I'm thinking more of this from like a student perspective. So whether or not they're interested in online gaming, whether or not they're interested in uh, maybe hiking experiences, sports, athletics, whatever it is, being able to connect that um, and this is why I think the, the, the assessment, the CQ assessment is so powerful because when students take it and they see their cultural values and they see it, then it begins to sort of give them an idea of, oh, I never thought about the way that I see the world and the way that I interact others being shaped by my cultural values. I didn't even know that I had these. Um, I think another one, which is 
you know, sort of in the DEI space, you know, people are always making the business case for diversity, equity, inclusion. I think there's almost like making a case for it in terms of career, you know, like most companies, if they're planning on working for a big company, or if they're planning even on starting their own company, they're going to be working with um, people from different cultural backgrounds. You know, it's it's just given, given, you know, the, the way, again, how small the world is. So having them understand that, Having cultural intelligence will help them be a better entrepreneur, will help them be a better team member, a better colleague, and all of that, um, I think are great ways to motivate students. I think um, another piece of it is that they think, you know, like Roman mentioned, you know, when you're when you're in the US or wh whatever city you live in, right, you're sort of like a fish in water. So everything makes sense, right? You, um, but then if you're if you so for example like I've never been to New York and just the thought of going to New York scares mm -hmm. me because it's you know it's such a big huge urban space and I'm sure that there's things culturally about New York that I'm not aware of being in Las Vegas right and so I would experience culture shock just going to another part of the United States just as I think people from other parts of the country might experience culture shock coming to the west coast which is very provincial you know it's not um <laughs> You know, it's still the wild, wild west out here um, for the most part. And so I think, you know, having students begin to kind of understand that culture exists everywhere in their homes, um, in their relationships with other people is a really great way for them to begin thinking about it and to become more interested in it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think it's, it's just being aware of it is already a, a big step that I think a lot of people are just not even aware of culture. Mm -hmm. And um, just that awareness is, is a big first step in, in yeah. building your cultural intelligence. And I think to add to that, Roma, in, one of, in, in my workshops, one of the first or one of the icebreakers I go to now and again is I ask everybody in the room to share what their uh, cure or their family's cure is for the common cold. And I mean, you get so many different stories and examples of all these home remedies and very rarely do you hear, but sometimes you do hear somebody would be like, well, when I was a kid and I got a cold, I went to the hospital and people would make value judgments like you went to the hospital for a cold. Uh, <laughs> but those are really the opportunities that I tell people when you're making those kinds of judgments, when things surprise you about someone, those are really opportunities for you to learn about why did that surprise you and how could you adjust you know, your mental map, you know, that's kind of giving you information. So I almost think about cultural intelligence, not so much as like um, something that you know or don't know, but it's more about learning a set of skills that allow you to be able to pick up from, pick up information from other cultures. So more of sort of gathering of information. Right. It's, it's definitely not something that's static. It's something that's dynamic and you mm -hmm. build on the base that you have um Roman, okay can so I, can i chime in here real quick sure. yeah go for it ryan so this this is uh ryan Dabala, also a colleague of mine at learn from travel hey ryan hey justin how you doing nice to meet you nice to meet you too um so i just i, I had a quick comment and then also a question uh first of all great great presentation this has been fascinating sorry i chimed in a little late but um i've, I've gathered a lot from this and i think what you were just saying now is is really interesting to me because if we can take this soft skill of being culturally intelligent and show that it has you know, tangible benefits in the long run, whether it's being a better entrepreneur or, or being a better um, communicator or a better, or you know, developing more empathy and just being a better teammate, whatever it might be, or, 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 or better partner, I think that that can certainly motivate people to go to certain countries and make that a goal to become more culturally fluent, more culturally intelligent. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions that I was thinking about um, as you were speaking, and, and this is this is probably a difficult question to answer, um, is that in my travels, I've, I've, I've been with the students in, in, in countries where they've taken a step back and they reach this, this sort of understanding that like, okay, well, this, 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 not only is the culture here different, but um, ethically, I feel like this is crossing a line, right? Like an example I'll give you in Ecuador, um, I've had, you know, there are people who will come through and, and they'll see that, that the locals are eating guinea pigs and they're like, oh, guinea pigs, you know, I had a guinea pig growing up as a pet. 
this is like, this is crossing an ethical line. Like we don't eat our pets, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess what, what ways can we, you know, prepare our students to deal with cultural differences that might start to you know, contradict their own ethical values or what they feel like are ethical values deep down inside? You know, that's kind of, that might be kind of a difficult question because I know that there are cultural practices that like are just way out of line in terms of what my ethical values are. Um, and so I don't necessarily su support those cultural practices. Um, um, so let me let's see if I could uh, maybe <laughs> yeah. try to answer. I, I get what you're saying, Ryan. So I think that the purpose of CQ is not for us to like change who we are. It's for us to understand who we are, understand our values, what things are important to us, and understand how we can adapt when we're in an environment where the values expectations are different. So in my consulting work, coaching work with helping people to enhance their CQ, a lot of it, it are with new managers. So people who went from being really excellent contributors, and then now they've moved into a role where they're managing a team. And sometimes it's a globally distributed team and they're trying to figure out, well, I was such a great individual contributor, which led to me getting promoted. But now how do I motivate all these other people from different countries, different cultural backgrounds to get something done? So now for, for, for example, if I know I had somebody on my team who might not be willing to eat the guinea pig, they might not be the person that I would send to a meeting with some a place where they would be serving guinea pig, right? right. As a leader, I might choose someone who I know might be willing to, to, to adapt, right? So it doesn't necessarily make you a bad person because you don't eat guinea pig. That's a belief that's important to you. That's something that you hold. And you know that that is something that you would never do. So that's important, but it's about not necessarily judging the other group because, well, they're eating the guinea pig, but understanding historically maybe why that has become part of their diet, right? Mm -hmm. or, or, or what the significance of that particular, um, you know, place in, 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 you know, how important that is. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think maybe from a leader perspective, that's what I often share with the people that I'm coaching, that it's about you being able to understand how you, when to adapt versus when not to adapt. And I always say you make the decision based on what gets you closer to the, the outcome that you're looking for. So if you're trying to close a million dollar deal and it depends on whether or not somebody is going to eat the guinea pig, then you send the person who's <laughs> <laughs> it's going to eat it, right? That, that, that's what you do at the end of the, you, you know, if, in, in a way it's a business decision, it's a people decision. But um, if you aren't a person who's going to eat the guinea pig, then that's okay. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That doesn't make you less of a yeah. good person. It just means that you have a really good understanding of who you are. Yeah, no, thanks. I think you answered that question well, because the last thing you want is someone who's who who's judging an entire culture based off of one practice, right? And so you want to help them develop this this appreciation for why that behavior exists and um, and just kind of think about try to think about it from more of a culturally relativistic standpoint instead of like looking down on everything, right? You know, you know who made some really great adverts about this were HSBC. I don't know if you've ever seen them where they have like a picture of a pug and then it has like in one culture, it's like an alarm clock. And then in one culture, it's like a pet. And then in another cult, I can't remember exactly, but they have several adverts like that, that they had like in the airport and in the train station about us understanding different cultures and how we might be looking at one thing, but people are seeing a different thing. So it's just like in the US largely, right? We, just, we look at a guinea pig, we see pet. In another culture, we look at that and, you know, they might, you know, there was a huge thing in Belize to bring Belize into this. Uh, when the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, II first visited Belize and they served her a relative of the guinea pig, which is an agouti, um, you know. <laughs> and uh, that's how the, the agouti in Belize earned the name of the royal rat because somebody, you know, they, they cooked it and served it to the queen. And so, um, you Did know, she eat it? I guess... I don't think she, I doubt she ate it, but you know, you know, in the, I guess, I don't know who the, the press in, in the UK, you know, ran with that story and were really offended that she came to Belize and they would serve her. But in Belize, it's a delicacy. It's part of, you know, growing up, like, you know, you go hunting and they, they grow, you know, they, they live wild. And so it's a, it's a part of, I mean, maybe not so much now, but you know, at least when in that time, when she visited, you know, um, it was a, a is that what a staple is what it's called? Like people ate, you know, that's what they would eat.
Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, Brian, thanks for that. That's a great question. I think that, yeah, diet in particular is like a great um, avenue for exploring culture and cultural differences and um, adaptability and a lot of the relevant topics that we're talking about. So I want to, we only have about 10 minutes left. I want to show a few photos of Belize, uh, taking advantage of, of having Justin here so you can talk a little bit about um, what we are seeing. Let me... Um, um, in the meantime, yeah. while you're pulling that up, Roman, I saw someone uh, down here ask uh, a question too that I could address. Okay. Um, they were asking, how can a small study abroad office assist students to achieve um, CQ? Um, with few resources, of course. Um, Cynthia, I, again, I, I give a political answer here that it depends on what your goals are in terms of improving CQ. Um, you know, it costs nothing to do a little bit of research and maybe creating a workshop um, for your students. There's some really great YouTube videos out there. I'm happy to point you um, if you um, get, if I can share my email here. Um, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to point you in the direction of some really great articles and books that you could um, uh, use and maybe develop a, a little presentation or something that you want to share with your students to at least um, introduce them to the concept. And then um, the Cultural Intelligence Center offers um, some assessments that you can pay for. They do come at a cost. Um, so, you know, you know, depend, I don't know what small resources mean, but, um, you know, there are some freemium things that you could do to, um, introduce students to the concept. Great. So I, I'm assuming that you can see my screen now. Um, I, I want to start with just the flag of Belize, which is one of my favorite flags, just because of how much it contains. And because, you know, as I mentioned, Belize is one of the most multicultural countries that I've traveled to. Multiculturalism is represented on this on this flag. Um, can you talk a little bit about the flag, Justin, and kind of you know um, what it's like to be from a country that's so young and still kind of building its national identity in the context of a very diverse multicultural um, um, uh, population? Sure. So. Um... Well, maybe let's start with the the flag, um, the 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 M the, uh, at the bottom here. Um, the motto is uh, "Subombra Floreo." It's um, Latin for "Under the Shade We Flourish." And uh, so, the way Belize became a country was um, nobody really wanted to settle there because uh, they thought it was just swampland. So the Spanish. Um, didn't make a settlement there. The, the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef made it a very difficult um, place to um, navigate. And so uh, what happened, though, was the British eventually settled on the coast. Um, they were buccaneers, so they were pirates. <laughs> and they used, they, they learned how to navigate the reef and use it to their advantage to rob other, um, you know, European ships as they were navigating the, the Yucatan Peninsula. And then slowly they began moving further inland and realized that it was more than just a swamp, that there were actually um, indigenous people living there, but that there was actually a wealth of um, hardwoods and different precious woods. And so that's sort of where it emerged. And so that's represented here. So the sort of wood cutting and uh, export of logwood and mahogany um, became sort of the, the main major export and led to the development of um, Belize as a colony and then uh, eventually as a you know, country. Um, the, one of the things that, you know, when I, before I traveled a lot to Central America, um, I didn't have a lot of knowledge of the indigenous people in Central and South America. And um, you know, I, I thought that I think, I think many people have this perception that the Maya are kind of like the Inca, that there aren't a lot of Maya still around. Um, but Belize actually has uh, three distinct groups of Maya, um, some of which we work with as, as a company and some who, who offer tourism services. Um, could you talk a little bit about that, uh, maybe in the context of your own background um, mm-hmm. and the, the photo that we're seeing here uh, with uh, the men? Sure. So uh, yes, as Roman mentioned, there's three groups. Um, there's two that are really sort of native to the, that part of the, or indigenous is, you know, uh, to that part of the Yucatan Peninsula. There's the Yucatec um, Maya to the north, 
And then like the Belize River sort of splits Belize into two. So then the southern portion is the Mopan Maya. We also have uh, Kechi uh, Maya groups, but they are sort of more, um, they moved and migrated into southern Belize as well. Um, but they're more from the highlands of um, Guatemala. So um, those are the three sort of major uh, indigenous groups that you'll find um, in Belize. Actually, there's one other group too that we consider indigenous to the Americas, not necessarily to Belize, but they're the Garifuna group. Um, and they're an Afro-indigenous group that we also, oh, Roman has a picture here of them. So they um, were actually exiled by the British from the island of St. Vincent. Um, and so they came to uh, Belize as refugees. And so what you'll learn about Belize is that uh, it, it was sort of a refugee resettlement state. For, so a lot of the uh, the British sent a lot of refugees there, including, um, I don't know if there's the men, a picture here of the Mennonite community too. Um, they were also allowed entry into Belize um, as refugees as well. So um, a lot of Belize's sort of ethnic and cultural diversity comes from this legacy of colonialism and then the British sort of offering it as a place um, for refugees. So a lot of uh, folks from Latin American countries, including um, El Salvador um, also came to Belize as refugees. And can you talk, so I, I didn't even know about this, but there are East Indian communities in Belize as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? I have to look up what East sure. Indian means. So that's part of my uh, heritage. So my mom is East Indian. My dad is what's considered mestizo, which is um, indigenous, uh, mixed with Spanish, like everything completely mixed. Um, but yes, so uh, the East Indian presence is in Belize is actually linked to the American Civil War. So after the Civil War, a lot of Confederates, I guess, didn't want to remain in the South. And so they bought up property or land, I should say, in Southern Belize, and they moved down there and they started cultivating sugarcane and rice. But because slavery had already been abolished in the Caribbean, um, they couldn't um, have slaves. And so the British were bringing laborers indentured through indentureship from uh, India, um, from the Bay of Bengal. And so my ancestors came to Belize, well, came to Jamaica uh, through indentureship. And then the American Confederates uh, brought them from Jamaica to uh, southern Belize um, to work on the sugar plantations and rice. My great great grandfather actually was a rum distiller um, and he made rum. And so that is partially why that, that ethnic group is so small in Belize. Um, it was because Belize was in a primary um, place of indentureship for them, but they came here as a result of working with American Confederates or former, I guess, American Confederates. Got it. Um... So we talked a lot about cultural diversity. I just want to briefly mention that Belize is one of the most amazing places in terms of biodiversity as well. Um, the, the Belize Zoo, this photo is probably from the zoo, um, has, uh, it, it's, a, it's a place where a lot of animals are rescued, including a number of jaguars. Um, you could be literally face to face with a jaguar there, um, separated by a chain link fence, <laughs> which I found to be a, a really uh, exciting experience. Um, there's a lot of different birds. Ryan, I'm going to put you on the spot. I know you know this bird, but do you know this bird? Of course I know that bird. Vermilion flycatcher. Which one? Vermilion flycatcher. Vermilion flycatcher, yes. So uh, Ryan is a, is a bird birding enthusiast and uh, oh. knows, knows most of the birds. Then Belize is a bird watcher's paradise. Yeah, it really is. It's uh, tons and tons of birds there. Um, does uh, anybody know what kind of monkey this is? I, I know. <laughs> anybody other than howler Ryan monkey. or Justin? <laughs> <laughs> it's the howler monkey. You can hear them. Howler from monkey. Yeah. Black Not monkey. Black. Yeah, the howler monkey. Um, the Belize has amazing beaches, amazing snorkeling, diving. Um, it's, it's really a fantastic place to visit as a tourist, um, but because of all the things that we've talked about, it's a really, really fantastic place to visit as a student. And um, the, the programs there uh, we found to be just really rewarding and, and really fun for students. So I, that's my last slide. Um, we're right at about an hour. 
So we'll wrap up here. Um, if anybody has additional questions, uh, please feel free to uh, send them along to Justin. He just typed his um, email there. Justin, is it .co or .com? Dot yeah, com. just dot co. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that email is for Justin, and and you can also reach out, of course, uh, to learn from travel. Roman at learn from travel or info at learn from travel dot com. Yeah, and if you have anything, uh, please yeah direct through Roman. He knows how to find me. <laughs> Wonderful. And if you uh, would like to share this with your colleagues, uh, we will be uploading it to our YouTube channel. Uh, where you could find this, where you will be able to find this and also other videos from our previous international conversations. Justin, thanks again for joining us. I really you know, enjoyed our conversation. I hope I get to see you again in person soon. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Justin. Right. Thank you. See you all. Bye-bye, everyone.